Hello everyone, this is Capital Conversations. I'm Marsha Martin, and I am here with Colorado Senator Mike Foote, who represents Longmont and other less interesting places in the, <laughs> in the state legislature. Um, uh, Senator Foote was a sponsor last year of the landmark le legislation, Senate Bill uh, 181, which returned a great deal of local control over oil and gas regulations to municipalities and counties. And uh, we're here to talk with him today, even though he's still working for us in the legislature, we're here to talk to him about how that's panning out and where we are in the changes of rules that uh, have to follow on to that in order to implement. And so Senator Foote, why don't you tell us where <laughs> we are? Tell, tell us you have so you want me to tell about 181, and that's fine. You know, I can talk forever about that bill. And well, uh, you can actually talk for 10 minutes or less. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't talk forever about it. But yeah. uh, it's it's an expansive topic, and I'm happy to talk about it. And I was really pleased that we were able to pass the bill last year. It uh, was a culmination of a lot of efforts from a lot of folks in Boulder County, um, Boulder County legislative delegation, um, uh, residents groups and um, a lot of work from local officials as well to make sure that we passed it. So I want to make sure that to give credit where credit's due. But, you know, we did pass the bill last year and now we're really in the implementation phase of the bill, which means all the stuff that we put down on paper last year now has to be implemented by the state agencies and local governments. And so there's really two tiers to talk about, I think. One is how local governments seem to be implementing Senate Bill 181 and the other is how the state seems to be uh, implementing Senate Bill 181, and so I'll talk about those just briefly and then we can go on to the next question. And really the short answer to, to the locals is that it really depends. Um, Adams County has come out with rules and regulations. Um, Broomfield is actively working on theirs. I know Boulder County is working on theirs. Um, other localities are working on theirs. Aurora did a, an operator agreement with the, a big operator down there that um, in my opinion, really didn't take much advantage of Senate Bill 181. Uh, Commerce City has been working with operators there, which I don't think are really taking very full advantage of Senate Bill 181. So it's really dependent on the locality, which actually is kind of how it, it usually works. I mean, there's some city councils or county commissions that were, are going to take full advantage of the, uh, the, of the law and some that just aren't. And uh, I wish it was different, and certainly if they had a different makeup of their councils, maybe they would. Um, but the point of the bill with local control is to make sure that those localities that did want to go a lot further and did want to make sure that they protected health and safety much more than the state was apt to do, that they could take advantage of that. And I know that Longmont City Council has um, talked about it in, the, in that regard as well. Boulder County has done that as well. And just to the south of us with Broomfield, um, even though they're in a different county, but what they do affects us as well. Um, they've done that, they, certainly with their newest council, they really uh, focused on taking full advantage of Senate Bill 181. So that's on the local level. And then on the state level, we're still in the midst of a lot of rulemakings where the state actually has to put more pencil to paper to come up with even more specific rules about uh, what covers the oil and gas industry and and how they're going to implement what the legislature told them to do in Senate Bill 181. They've done, I think, three rulemakings at this point, but the major one is actually coming up. And it's going to be a rulemaking that deals with the mission change of the agency, which is, uh, uh, could be a big deal. It deals with cumulative impacts of oil and gas operations. So, you know, if you have one well in one location, that's a lot different than wanting to put in 10 wells where there's already 100 wells in that general area. So that's cumulative impacts and then alternative site analysis and what's required to do that. And so that's, in my opinion, that's going to be one of the biggest ones that's happening. I think um, maybe mid-April or so is when we'll have the results of that. So um, that's, that's just, it's not starting out, but the formal process of it is just getting underway and we'll have a good idea of how the state intends to really formally implement 181, but that won't be the end of it because 
in um, June, there's going to be a professional commission uh, that's going to be appointed to the COGCC with a lot of um, new people, at least on the commission. And uh, they're going to undertake more rulemakings on things that they haven't been able to cover yet. So it's still kind of to be determined, and that's not even to consider uh, what's happening with the Air Quality Control Commission on the Department of Public Health and uh, Environment side. A lot of alphabet soup here, and there's a lot of state agencies to keep track of. Uh, but the bottom line is, based on Senate Bill 181, they've been quite busy, actually, to try to implement what the legislature told them to do. And generally speaking, I've been pretty happy with their direction. Although, like anything, I, I can't say I agree with 100% of their decisions, but I think it's been much different than what we've seen coming up to 2019. Prior to 2019 and Senate Bill 181, we saw a commission that was pretty much in the business of promoting the industry and allowing them to drill pretty much where they wanted to. They wouldn't say no to permits, and that was ingrained within their culture. And what we've tried to do with Senate Bill 181 is to change that culture, and that's not something that happens overnight, but they have leadership there that has bought into that. We have a governor that has bought into that, in my opinion, and the legislative direction has been pretty clear, so we just have to see how it works out, but it's not a very quick process. I, I know that people probably agree with me when I say that. You would as well. <laughs> it's yeah, not I would. happening overnight. I was getting ready to point out that it seems like uh, Governor Polis uh, uh, signed Senate Bill 181 in uh, about April of last year. That's right. yep. And so now you're saying, yeah, the cumulative impacts rulemaking is going to come up a year later. Yeah. And, and that's not as quick as some people have wanted, for sure. And I know that there's been requests to put all permits on hold until all the rulemakings are done. And, and, Whoa. And, <laughs> and, all, and so I know that's out there. And so I'm sure that some of the viewers are going to disagree with my assessment and think that it, they wish it would have gone faster or that we would have paused the permits. And I understand that perspective completely. Those are two sides of the same, of, of the same coin, right? Pausing the permits means going... Well, no, they're right. It's the same thing. Pausing the permits means freeze everything until we have all the rules in place. Right. Um, which is the uh, end result of make the rule makers go very much faster. Yeah, and they didn't do that. Um, although the number of permits that have been granted has, has gone down. It's about half of what it was before. But mm -hmm. I know from a climate perspective and I know from a health and safety perspective, there's some that feel that that's not good enough. And so I get that. The thing about Senate Bill 181 is I think that it pushes us in the right direction um, and it, it's, it's, it's good in that regard, but it's not perfect. I mean, it's legislation, so it's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you were heard to say in the Capitol building during the time that uh, 181 was being debated that this bill is not intended to enable local fracking bans. Um, now I ask somebody else, and they said, uh -huh. gee, what does intent mean? Uh -huh. um, but what did you mean? Well, so I never actually said that. Okay. Um, because I've always, when, when the bill was debated, uh, we purposely kept that out of the bill. We did mm -hmm. not address that in the bill at all. And so there's nothing in the bill about you can or can't do fracking bans. And that I was, see. That was on purpose, because if you address it one way or another, the bill doesn't pass. And so that is kind of an, a question that was not answered by Senate Bill 181. So it was a deliberate ambiguity, not an accidental one, or not, and not yeah. a matter of intent. We had to leave it out, mm -hmm. or else the bill would have just been caught up in who knows what. I mean, it already was, in order to pass Senate Bill 181 or any legislation of this size that makes this kind of change, mm -hmm. Um, it's a tight rope that you have to walk. And so um, we just, and, and this was the same with setbacks as well. You know, I'll just go into that because we deliberately left any kind of setbacks discussion out of the bill. There's, the word setback is not in the bill. So um, we left that out. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that local governments can't deal with setbacks. C clearly they can, but there's just some topics that we're gonna make it so that whichever, whatever we did was going to, was going to fuel the fire against the bill. Um, and we just wanted to try to minimize that. So 
Senate Bill 181 is silent on local fracking bans. It's silent on setbacks. Mm -hmm. And that was just part of how we did the bill. There's a little, there's a little difference in setbacks um, because that's a way that municipalities regulate every damn thing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it would be really hard to make any kind of an assertion that, that this bill, because it's silent on setbacks, doesn't allow uh, a municipality to use a setback as a means of regulation. On the other hand, bans are commonly yeah. acknowledged to be different. Yeah, and so that, that's a good point. I should be clear that um, there was some discussion, and certainly part of the debate was, should there be a mandated minimum setback in the bill that's mm -hmm. law? So <clears throat> if you look at Proposition 112 in 2018, it mandated a 2,500-foot setback. That failed, as we know. But there was question, should we try to put in a 1,000-foot setback or a 2,500-foot setback or, or whatever? And that was where we stayed silent was along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I think I wanted to make that clear because your question was a good one. We, we, didn't, we didn't have any illusions that setbacks weren't going to be addressed uh, from the local government mm -hmm. side. So I, I, it, 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 hopefully my answer didn't create that impression, and if so, I hope that cleared it up. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's fine. That's what you're here for. Okay, so Longmont at the moment doesn't have a fracking problem, although we might have a fracking mm -hmm. problem. Uh, after uh, Proposition th uh, Amendment 300, the long, famous Longmont fracking ban that might have been one of the ancestors of 181, mm -hmm. uh, was overturned in the Supreme Court. We set back to work and said, all right, well, we can't do that. What can we do? And what we could do is, as Broomfield and some of the other municipalities that you mentioned have done, negotiate with the owners of our mineral rights and get them to move their drilling points outside the city. Because we can't regulate anything outside the city, mm -hmm. uh, but we can do that. And we were very successful in that in the sense of getting uh, all the drilling point access is contractually required to be at least 2,000 feet outside the Longmont city limits. And 2,000 feet in terms of the um, health impact data for mm -hmm. adjacency to a fracking site is a magic number. You know, the ill effects go way down. Right. So uh, we're happy about that. But then the thing that happened is uh, Another organization has brought suit against Longmont. And let me pause to say that the expenditure of, that Longmont went through between defending the original fracking ban um, and then uh, uh, defending uh, some regulatory uh, mm -hmm. uh, lawsuits that followed that um, that we actually won and, and were part of, part of the leverage that allowed us to negotiate this deal. Um, we spent, uh, in, just in terms of external counsel, about $360,000 of taxpayer money to get this done. And by the time you, you know, the sunk costs in the city, administrative costs, paying the city's employed attorneys and everything. It's coming up to $400,000 to get Longmont to the point where it is today. Uh, and then a, a, a future payment of about $3 million in, a, in deferred royalties that we're gonna put back on uh, the drilling companies in exchange for their, their cooperation. So Longmont spent a lot of right. money um, getting fracking out of the out of town, uh, and now someone comes back and says we're going to resurrect this fracking ban. And interestingly enough, they're suing Longmont mm -hmm. to require us to enforce it. To enforce it, right? If they win, if they win, right? Um, but we don't have a fracking problem. It's all outside our jurisdiction. So my question to you is, how much is Longmont supposed to pay so that everybody else can have a fracking ban? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 can't, uh, I, I can't speak for those that made the decision to file the lawsuit. You know, they did it for their reasons. I know their argument is that 
the people of Longmont voted overwhelmingly for the fracking ban, so it should actually be enforced. But I understand your perspective too, which is that uh, like a local government should do, and certainly local governments can do even much more under 181, we kind of address the issue. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of just a, a practicality versus um, the ideal situation, I suppose. So I, I get that discussion. Um, you know, I, I wish that it didn't come down to this in the first place. I wish that actually the voters that voted for a fracking ban could have been honored and that there didn't have to be a lawsuit that ended up going to the Supreme Court. That might have solved the issue, but that's not where we are. So all I can say is going forward, um, I'm glad that Longmont has taken the solution that it has, and I think other localities should look at Longmont as one potential model for what they can do. I know other localities are looking at much longer setbacks, for example, um, uh, even zoning it in certain areas. And also they should be clear that 181 does give them the ability to say no to oil and gas development if it's not consistent with health and safety, which is something that was not clear before. So how you get there is um, should be up in some ways, uh, many ways to the local governments, which as you noted, local governments do all the time with other stuff, which was part of the big reason why we went that way with oil and gas. I didn't quite understand that last statement. That you well, made. you talk about how local governments can do things like zoning and setbacks for mm -hmm. other types of uses. Yeah. But prior to 181, it wasn't clear that that was something that they were allowed to do under state uh, law. And although now, now, I, now it is. It is clear, although I would argue before 181, localities could do that, but there was significant discussion and significant disagreement. And also there was localities that were pretty risk averse because they knew the industry would sue them just like they did with Longmont. $400,000 worth. Right, and as you noted, after the 2011 process, um, Longmont put in regulations that the industry didn't like that mm -hmm. were different than state regulations and they got sued. And then the people of Longmont passed the ban and then they got sued for that. Yeah. And so the industry certainly has shown itself to be litigious, um, not afraid to engage in litigation. Um, and so that was part of why we wanted to clear things up with 181 is to take that out of the equation. That doesn't mean the industry will never sue again because they're certainly very heavy handed at times and if they don't get their way, then they're gonna explore every opportunity they have. But I think the law is a lot clearer now that localities can do things like Longmont has done and other things that Longmont has considered in the past. So if Longmont did things that were lawful even before 181, um, to uh, carry out the will of the people, even though the exact will of the people in the terms of the fracking vote uh, couldn't be carried out because of the court ruling. Um, what we've done there now is put ourselves in a legal dilemma where we have one contract that says, you won't stop us from exploiting these mineral rights or you are liable, Longmont. And if um, the Colorado Rising suit were to be victorious, then apparently we would be enjoined to do exactly what our contract doesn't allow us to do. And um, if you were Longmont's lawyer, how would you defend in that situation? Well, but I thought you said that they're not drilling within town limits anyway, which is your jurisdiction, right? They're not, but Colorado Rising says that that ban includes the subsurface drilling and some of the horizontal bores do go underneath Longmont. Oh, right, I see. And they expect um, to disallow those bores. I'm, I have a hard time seeing that, so I'm, not, I'm less worried about it than I was, but I want everybody to know about mm -hmm. it because because that is what Colorado Rising says, is we're gonna get rid of those horizontal bores. Right, yeah, so the difference is um, underneath the ground as opposed to surface impacts. Mm -hmm. So you, you've managed to get the surface impacts outside of the town yes. of Longmont. However, there's still some drilling that's happening underneath mm -hmm. the ground of Longmont City Territory. Right, yeah. deep underneath the ground. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I'd, I guess you've created a very good question that a lot of lawyers could probably get paid some money to try to discuss. And so I don't know if <laughs> I want Including you, I hear that this is gonna be your last term in the Senate. That's right, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the private practice of law now. I started last July, so if, uh, if it turns out that you feel like that uh, this may be a question I could answer as a private lawyer, you never know. But I really don't know the answer, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm not trying it's to mess around one. with you because 
Um, but I think that you know it's it's a very difficult question because what it comes down to is you have two you may have two conflicting things you have mm -hmm. contract versus city charter mm -hmm. and so when you put those things that can't be reconciled together which one is going to win and I wish I could I mean I, I can't tell you the answer yeah. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head just as as a general attorney which I am not does the timeline matter at all in terms of liability for Longmont? I mean, we did this, it was set aside, we did something else, which was lawful at the time, and then, and then the Charter Amendment would be reinstated, making the contract that we engaged in an unlawful contract retroactively? Can, can we be liable for that situation? So I think most good lawyers are going to tell you the answer is always maybe. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, I do think the timeline matters. I think yeah. it's something that's going to be part of the discussion if it comes down to this and part of the court's analysis. And one side will argue one way and the other side will argue the other way and the judge will decide. But I, um, again, you know, these are difficult issues. There does not seem to be precedent for it. So I couldn't draw uh -huh. upon some precedent from other towns or even really other states, frankly, mm -hmm. to tell you how those courts have gone because it's pretty unique circumstances. I mean, yeah. the Longmont fracking ban plus what you all have done with the surface impacts, and if you combine the two, they're not reconcilable. So which one is going to win? I guess maybe we can do another episode in a year and try to hash that out <laughs> a little bit more. So. It probably, it may not be a year, <laughs> but I would sure love to have you back. We are out of time now. Uh, and I had a whole set of topics <laughs> that were easier than that one, actually. Oh Not that much easier, but some easier right. uh, that we need to get to. It. And so maybe when we get a little bit uh, closer to the cumulative effects rulemaking, you mm -hmm. can come back and we can talk about it because it was a cumulative effects discussion that I hoped would be uh, our, our third topic. Sounds good. So thank you, Senator okay. Foote, thanks for a lot. coming to talk to me. Yeah, thanks for and, having me. Uh, this is Capital Conversations. I'm Marsha Martin.